Hi, welcome to Easy, Secure, and Fast using Nats.io for streams and services. Let me introduce myself. My name is Colin Sullivan. I run product at Synadia.com or at Synadia. Uh, I'm a Nat, I've been a Nats Core maintainer for uh, about five years now, and I've been building distributed systems for over 20 years. Today, we'll talk about uh, Nats in general. We'll talk about streams and services, topology, um, security, and then some additional features and the roadmap. And throughout this presentation, you'll see how um, streams and services or application patterns, topology, and security can be put together to make some very powerful solutions. First off, what is NATS? NATS is a 10-year-old production-proven cloud-native distributed communication system. NATS was made for developers and operators who just want to do their jobs, who don't want to think about managing a messaging system. So what's important to us is performance, simplicity, security, and availability. NATS was built from the ground up to be cloud-native. Cloud Foundry was actually its first use case. Uh, NATS supports multiple qualities of service. We support multiple communication patterns and over 40 types of clients, so um, we should have you covered. NATS is used for cloud messaging with microservices, services, uh, event and data streaming, uh, command and control, and more and more we're finding that people are using NATS and extending out to the edge where um, there's IoT and edge components with telemetry, sensor data, and again, more command and control, and also, uh, a number of our users are using NATS to augment or replace legacy messaging technologies where they might currently have an investment in some legacy technology, but want to extend out into the cloud and bridge into NATS for that. We uh, joined CNCF as an incubation project in 2018, and we're part of the messaging and streaming projects. And we have over a thousand contributors over the last 10 years with a uh, hundred or more with more than 10 commits. We've got uh, quite a few public repositories. We're hoping to break uh, 20,000 GitHub stars across all the repositories this year. Uh, we've got about 130 million um, Docker pulls between the NAT server and NAT streaming server, a very healthy Slack community, and a good cadence of NAT server releases since uh, 2014 with about five a year. NATS was created by Derek Hollis, and Derek's been solving the really hard problems in distributed computing over the last 30 years. Around NATS, Derek built a highly experienced messaging team, and, uh, and, and from that, we have a very, very engaged user community. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with our NATS community. It is great to see people jump in and help on Slack and watch community members help each other. In terms of end users, we really, NATS is a very uh, utilitarian type of technology, so it's very horizontal. So we've got end users of all sizes and all different verticals. NATS is simple. Uh, the server, which is our basic network element, is a uh, single binary. It's deployable anywhere. It's very small with uh, about a 10 megabyte Docker image. This lets it spin up very quickly in the cloud. The protocol itself that NATS uses to speak to the clients is uh, text-based. Now, don't get that confused that we can send any type of payload, but the very simple protocol makes it easy to write clients, and that's why we have so many of them. NATS is low configuration. When a client connects to the server, it doesn't need to know anything about the topology. It just needs a URL and credentials. Servers can auto-discover. Uh, you can share configuration files amongst servers, and NATS is very easy to code to. It's a very simple and straightforward API. We've got a number of NATS clients uh, that are supported by the NATS support and NATS maintainers, as well as the community with uh, many different languages, many different bindings. Now let's talk a bit about message patterns. And this is these are, are how your applications communicate with each other. And we tend to like to think of these in two buckets streams and services. A stream is a flow of data. It's just a number of messages going out um, and streams can fan out. You might have a stream of data you fan out to a thousand or 10,000 or a million subscribers. Then we have the concept of services. Services are where I want to ask an application to do some work and then return a result. Services are by far the most common that we see um, and services can be load balanced. Streams and services uh, at the application level, when you go to code, really fall into a couple patterns. 
which is request reply. These are your services. This is your RPC. Publish subscribe, which is uh, the basis for request reply, but pure pub sub is just a stream of data. And then you have load balance queue subscribers where NATS can load balance. And we do have a new higher level API coming that uh, more closely reflects this concept of applications being a stream and or a service. Before we talk about patterns, let's, let's talk about subjects and how data gets from one application to another. NATS routes data based on interest. So an application will register a subscriber with the subject indicating interest in something. So there's a very simple subject, your everlasting foo example, or let's take something more concrete. I'm interested in weather. So I create a subscriber for weather. These can be hierarchically tokenized. So foo.bar or weather.us.colorado.denver. This allows you to use wildcard subscriptions to create some very complex filtering. Um, and then also, you can uh, use unique subjects to create a logical one-to-one -one relationship between two applications. Streams are pretty simple. NATS will fan out published messages to all interested subscribers. It might be one subscriber, it might be a million, but uh, NATS takes care of that. And you can add or remove subscribers anytime at runtime with no configuration. NATS will just do the right thing and start routing information to them. The code to set up a, a stream today is, is very, very simple. You connect to a NAT server, you subscribe to a stream. In this case, I'm interested in data arriving on Foo. Uh, when that data arrives, I'm just gonna print it out. That's that log print line. And then the corresponding publish to get that data out onto Foo is just the publish API there. Extremely simple. This is actually could be a working application right here. Services are your one-to-one. -one. You can use unique, unique reply subjects where you make a request, the service does some work and returns a response. Here's the service API code. So you connect, in this case, to a local NAT server. You subscribe, I'm gonna be offering a service on the subject of help. And then when someone says, can you help? I'm gonna say, uh, yes, I'm gonna respond with a message that says I can help. On the requester side, I uh, below, I issue a request for help, say that I need some help, wait a second, up to a second for a response, and then just print the response when I get it. That's it, it's, it's very straightforward, very easy to code to NATS. NATS can also act as a layer seven load balancer. So when subscribers uh, subscribe, they can choose to be grouped together in a, um, in a queue group, when we call it a queue group, it's actually more like a work queue. It's, it essentially creates a pre competing consumer pattern. But what happens is the NAT server will then um, randomly distribute messages to these uh, subscribers. And this allows you to set up a service and set up a number of services that will um, automatically scale as if it were a layer seven load balancer. Uh, again, you can add these services anytime, remove them anytime, and NATS just does the right thing. No additional configuration. This allows you to very, very easily scale. So now that we've covered our patterns in the, at the application level, let's talk about topology. Topology is the plumbing, uh, or you know, think of it like the electrical grid for your messages. This is where messages may arrive. And NATS has a number of building blocks for topology. The lowest common denominator, the simplest thing is your server. That's like a network element. Servers can be grouped together to form one cohesive unit called a cluster that provides higher availability um, and uh, lets you scale. Clusters can be clustered together to create what we call a super cluster. And outside of these clusters are leaf nodes, which are NAT servers that kind of act as a client they aren't part of a cluster, but they're connected to it and can, and can relay messages to and from it. The very, very simple setup, which is what most developers will do on their, on their machines, is a single server with a couple NATS clients connected to it. Clusters, when you cluster NATS servers, are full hop or a full mesh one hop. That means uh, NATS servers will always route messages in the shortest number of hops that, that are available. Clusters clustered together are super clusters again. We use what are called gateway connections between the clusters 
Uh, gateway connections are optimized for a WAN, optimized for um, low late or optimized for higher latency, lower bandwidth connections. And any number of clusters can be grouped together uh, in a super cluster. At Synadia, we have a massive super cluster spread out across uh, various cloud vendors over the whole over the globe. So, um, so you can make these as large or as small as you need to. And leaf nodes, leaf nodes, a single NAT server extended out from a cluster. They extend via hub and spoke technology. Uh, they do a couple different things. They let you bridge different security domains. So you might use NAT security within your um, main deployment, and a leaf node might uh, use a different security scheme out on an edge device or, or um, remote node. Uh, these are ideal for edge computing, IoT hubs, data centers, anything that's remote that needs to be connected into a central, a central deployment. And then they can also transparently bridge on-premise and cloud deployments. Remember that NAT's clients don't care about the topology at all. They just know that they're connected to NAT. Here's a um, global deployment, an example of a global deployment where you might have a NAT cluster running in Kubernetes in San Diego, a NAT cluster running on VMs in Berlin, and another one in London on Kubernetes. You have a remote data center uh, that's clustered together with some services streams um, connected into San Diego, and then a leaf node that might be like a set-top box um, with devices connected to it. Now, the third part is security. And NAT's uh, security has some basics. So we have full TLS support, uh, MTLS. We support DNs or subject alternative names uh, to be used as identities. We have uh, standard user password authorization. Uh, you can set permissions on what applications or what users can send and receive and what subjects. Uh, you can change these at any time with zero downtime. Uh, you can adjust the config, have the NAT server reread it at runtime, and it'll do the right thing. And then with operator mode uh, in NAT 2.0, which which has about a, been out for about a year and a half, NAT supports multi-tenancy with um, operator mode. So in operator mode, you define an operator, which is really the owner of the NAT's deployment. You have um, accounts, and underneath accounts, you have users. And NATS allows you to set up this chain of trust between operators, accounts, and users within a deployment. And the operator's the root of trust for the system. So that's like an enterprise. Um, underneath the operator, you create accounts for account administrators. An account represents an organization. Um, it might be a team. It might be a group of microservices. It might be an IT group that's uh, monitoring the entire NATS deployment. And an account creation would likely be managed by a, a central group. And then underneath accounts, our accounts can expose streams and services. And underneath accounts, you have users that have specific credentials and permissions. So accounts are isolated communication contexts. What, um, what accounts do are when you've got multiple accounts on a server, applications connect into those accounts, those messages will never cross those account boundaries. That allows you to bifurcate technology from business-driven use cases. That allows you to create data silos um, based on these accounts. It's secure and cost-effective. So one NAT's deployment uh, is managed by an operator, yet teams uh, can be decentralized and self-managed. But when data does need to be shared between these accounts, you can share them with secure streams and services. So one account might offer a service on subject foo. Another account might say, hey, I want that service. They will import um, that service on foo, and suddenly that's available. And only with mutual agreement will data flow between accounts. Um, in NATS, uh, identities are represented by uh, N keys, which are housed in JWTs. Um, and keys are ED25519 keys made easy and associated with these M keys would be a user, an account, a cluster or a server. We used ED25519 because it's fast and resistant side channel attacks. Uh, we use those to sign and verify and we use them in such a way that NAT's system will never see private keys. Um, 
without getting into details, the uh, server sends a nonce during connect, the client signs the nonce with its private key, and then the server verifies that the client belongs to an account known by the server. Long story short, this is uh, letting NATS approach a zero trust system. And uh, all this stuff is managed by, by the NSC command line interface. So it's pretty easy to use to be able to set up these users. Uh, you don't have to worry about these details at all. When you combine topology and security with your application patterns, uh, we create the adaptive edge architecture. So. Over time, we found, as many companies have come to us and users have come to us, we found a pattern emerge. And if you squint, they all look the same, where you have this central central deployment with some streams and services attached to it that's available for everything. And then remotes, they might have their own services, their own streams, some of which might be shared, some which might be um, might not, and uh, depends on policy. But then you have these remote deployments that are all linked together to create a massive global deployment. This is essentially the IoT or the edge use case. And we found that through a combination of leaf nodes, clusters, and superclusters, NATS can handle this very well. And um, if you look at how this can be applied to different verticals, um, this pattern is very powerful. So very, very powerful. So example, in retail, you might have a regional headquarters uh, it will have some ad reward programs, coupons, logistics, uh, centralized inventory, where the remotes are the stores. And then you have POS devices connecting into the remote that then um, utilizes these streams and services, or uh, maybe even provides their own streams coming of stores coming back to the central. This is repeated over and over again for different use cases. And we found that you know, again, it's the it's a similar pattern in terms of topology. What changes are your streams and services and your security? Here's an example where uh, multiple airlines or airports, multiple airports are super clustered together in the EU, and um, extending out of the super cluster are leaf nodes inside terminals and concourses, even planes. This is your plumbing. This is your wiring. But then in terms of data flow, you've got a weather service where different airlines and airports can use this weather service, but the airlines themselves will never talk to each other. These are all set up by accounts and streams, um, streams and service sharing. Now let's segue into performance and scalability. NATS performs extremely well with um, about 18 million messages a second in one server. Uh, one data stream, 80 million messages a second with multiple services. Some of this is is um, a vanity metric, but it translates into scalability and resource utilization. So if a single NAT server can handle 18 million messages a second, that means if you only need a few thousand messages a second or 20,000 messages a second, a single NAT server is going to do you well for a long time. You aren't going to have to scale for a while. And also, you can use less compute resources to um, do the same thing you might be able to with a, a different system. The health and availability of the system in the whole is prioritized in NAS. Uh, traditional messaging systems would, would spend resources on trying to make sure that a poorly behaving application always got the message. That doesn't work in cloud. So, to that end, the NAT server performs selfish optimization. If there is a poorly behaving client or poorly behaving server, the NAT server will cut it off. And then at that point, an operator will look at it. We've got full mesh clustering in the NAT servers and the server and client connection self heal. This creates a, a um, low maintenance, always on, always available deployment for NATs. NATs also has auto discovery. What this means is as you scale up or scale down NAT servers in a cluster, this information is shared with the other NAT servers. You don't have to do additional configuration. You don't have to bring anything down or bring it back up again to change your topology. And this information is also shared with clients. That means clients can fail over to servers they were never originally configured with. 
Uh, and these are great for rolling upgrades or, you know, even swapping out your back end with different machines. If you need to upgrade machines, do, do whatever you need to do. Your clients can remain running. We have a couple different message guarantees. Uh, at its core, we support at most once where there's no guarantee of delivery or messages can be lost. This sounds harsh, but uh, it's how the internet works today. And then we have at least once, which are where a message will always be delivered in certain cases, certain error conditions, it can be delivered more than once. Uh, I've always said in the past, exactly once is unnecessary, complex, it's always slow, um, but due to popular demand, we're going to support it in Jetstream. Jetstream is uh, the next generation of net streaming. It uh, supports, there's a lot of overlap with NAT streaming, but it also supports wildcard support, NAT's 2.0 security, so it's, it's um, account aware. Uh, it's got data at rest encryption. You can cleanse specific messages. So, and this was a request uh, that really helps out with GDPR and horizontal scalability. So as you need to scale, you just launch more Jetstream servers. And uh, like NAT streaming, you can replay messages by timer sequence. So there is an overlap. Uh, NAT streaming will continue to be supported. We've got millions and millions of Docker downloads. We know it's deployed globally uh, uh, in production. So to that end, we'll provide bu bug fixes and security fixes until June of 2022. That being said, moving forward, new NATs enabled applications that need streaming should prefer Jetstream. Uh, we'll provide a migration path and um, new NATs development as it relates to streaming will occur in Jetstream. Here are some additional features of NATs. We have uh, distributed tracing. When we use open tracing, we've got reference architectures in Java and Go. Um, and uh, this allows you to use NATs to trace messages in your application uh, across you know, microservices or what have you. We've got a number of integrations into Spring, Kafka. Uh, we're working on a JMS bridge right now, and we do have an MQ series uh, adapter. Or bridge. We have NAT Surveyor. So Surveyor can monitor your entire entire deployment from one entry point into NATs. Um, it provides a comprehensive view of the entire NATs deployment. So if I've got Surveyor running on my laptop, I just connect to my NATs deployment and I can see everything so long as I have the right uh, credentials. This makes this prevents you from having to install a lot of sidecars to monitor NATs. And we use Grafana as a dashboard. Uh, we provide um, centralized visualization, but you can also drill down into and look at individual servers. And then um, we uh, work well in Kubernetes. Uh, we've got a single command line to install a full NATS cluster in a Kubernetes deployment. It defaults and installs NATS as a stateful set. And uh, along with that, we give you a surveyor installation so you can see what's going on. And our roadmap moving forward, uh, in the latest release, we've got uh, WebSocket support in the NAT server. We've got a WebSocket client, number of leaf nodes improvements. Uh, coming up in Q3 uh, will be the GA release of Jetstream. It has been uh, in tech preview for a while. We've gotten some excellent feedback. And the, the GA release will, be, um, will support clustering with high availability, fault tolerance, and then scalability as well. Um, we are, we have added message headers or we're in the process of adding message headers. Uh, we're doing this in such a way that it will not affect the fast path. So you'll get the same performance. You've always gotten out of NATs. We've just added to the protocol. Uh, we have a NATs JMS bridge and then we've got those service and streams APIs I talked about earlier. Uh, in Q4, we're going to support native MQTT 311. Uh, there's a lot of MQTT deployments. We found that in bridging IoT and devices and edge compute with the cloud, NATS is a just a, a really cool solution to do that. So um, we're going to uh, you know adopt MQTT as native natively supported in the NATS server. We'll have monitoring enhancements. Uh, NATS Kafka bridge enhancements, and we're going to do some additional things to get from edge to edge, zero trust security. And then the first half of next year, further um, investment into MQTT. 
uh, WebAssembly support in the NATS ecosystem, where the, a NATS deployment might be able to run small sections of code that can act as a small application or um, filter messages. And then, uh, as always, we're providing additional ops and dev tooling with uh, additional distributed tracing and then uh, system-wide debug tooling. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, you know, I'd just like to open it up for any questions uh, that, that you might have. Okay, so um, some questions that have been asked is, uh, does NATS account for a client dropping away in, this, in the load balance setup? Will it retry another client? It really depends on whether you're using core NATS or um, streaming. With core NATS, uh, that, that happens at the application layer. So you make a request into a service and that request might time out and then you would try retry the request. On the back side, if um, let's say you're responding to the request, your application drops, crashes, what have you, um, that request will simply remain unfulfilled. It's up to the requester to retry. With um, if you do use persistence, and it's it's kind of an anti-pattern with request reply, but uh, persistence will retry queue subscribers. So if you use Jetstream or Net Streaming, it'll retry queue subscribers. Um, one more note about low balance queue subscribers is we do have an API to gracefully exit where you drain a connection, you let the NAT server know, hey, I'm, I'm going away, and then you continue to process the rest of those messages. You still have connectivity, you just won't receive any more. And that's a great way to gracefully leave a, a group. Another question, uh, what's the difference between NAT's Jetstream and Kafka? This is a, we, we could spend a lot of time on this. At a high level, I'll say that they're both log-based persistence. Um, Jetstream has pull models and push models. Um, but um, what, I, what I would encourage you to do is join our Slack group and, uh, you know, and ask, and we can go in depth and learn more about your use case to, to further dis differentiate. Is Jetstream already available? It is as a tech preview. Uh, sometime in Q4, we're gonna be GA, but right now it's uh, available as a tech preview. You can download nightly builds, play around with it. Uh, it and like I said, it'll be ready for production uh, fairly soon. Next question, when a new subscriber is created, can it retrieve historical messages from a stream or only messages from that point in time going forward? It can do either. So you can, create a new subscriber and say, hey, replay me everything you have, and whether it's from the beginning of history or the last hour, um, or you can create what's called a durable subscriber. And a durable subscriber just picks up where it left off. So that's, that's really your choice. And with Jetstream, one really cool feature is that you can replay messages um, with uh, a temporal context in that it will replay messages in the same um, burstiness, if you will, at the same rate it was originally, uh, the messages originally arrived, which is really good for, for stress testing, for um, QA, and just uh, in case that you do need to know the, uh, the, the rate that messages are coming in. Let's see, about scalability on Kubernetes, if you scale up in Kubernetes from two to three pods, is it needed to update the config map where the DNS of the pods are defined? Um, no, it's not. So when you scale up, let, let's talk about two cases. First, you're scaling up servers. When you scale up servers, uh, the servers talk to each other and they, they gossip and they, they share their topology with each other. This topology is also shared with the clients. So a client can, um, receive this information about the new server and it knows how to connect to it then. So the client can originally could fail over to a server it was a never, never originally configured with. In terms of clients, um, all the client needs to do is connect to, to NAT. So let's say I'm scaling up a service I wrote. When the service connects, there's location transparency in NATs. So um, 
you only really care about the subject, not necessarily where that service is located. In fact, that service might not even be in Kubernetes. If you have a leaf node deployment outside of Kubernetes leafed in, it can be there. All that is entirely transparent to your applications. Um, let's see, is there a way that NATS could guarantee the order of events? Um, yes, by default, NATS guarantees producer order uh, by producer. So if you have a single producer, multiple consumers, they're all going to see those messages in the same order. If you have multiple producers, those messages might be mixed up depending on how they flow through the system. But in terms of which producer it came from, they will always be in that same order by producer. Could you shed more light on what applications need to do to ensure no event is lost? So in Jetstream, it's as simple as enabling Jetstream, turning it on. And what will happen is Jetstream will re-deliver messages that are not acknowledged by the application. So um, that's really your decision whether to use Cornets, which is fire and forget, or to use Jetstream, which provides persistence. Um, how does NATS compare to Kafka in your opinion? Uh, this is a this is a very this could be a very long conversation. In in at a high level, um, Kafka is really just a publish subscribe system. Nats has the request reply on top of that, so Nats is a little different there. Um, in terms of persistence, Kafka is log based. Um, Nats um, is log based uh, when you enable persistence, so they're they're very similar there. Um, there's some feature differences. Um, here and there, generally Kafka has uh, more features right now. As we add WebAssembly, we're going to be able to match those features just in a very in a, in a different way. Be able to provide the same business, uh, be able to solve the same business problems just in a, in a slightly different way. Um, but generally, in terms of Kafka and Nats, we tend to like to think of things as it's an and conversation. So users can choose to use Nats. Um, on their own, they can choose to use only NATS, or if they already have a very heavy Kafka investment, but want to move and en enhance that with very lightweight messaging, we do have a uh, Kafka bridge to allow that. So we work very well with Kafka as well. Okay, um, let's see here. Can you elaborate on what the NATS cloud event at binding adds to a solution um, well basically that's if you already have a solution that's using cloud events um, then you can you know you, you have that schema by default nats is payload agnostic it will just send a, a series of bytes it's up to your applications to agree upon what format those come in um, cloud events provides a, a really, really nice way to define, hey, here's what an event looks like. Here's what it means. Here's what these fields mean. And um, when you add cloud events into NATS, you enrich NATS to provide that, that schema, that meaning behind uh, messages. And it looks like that's about it for questions right now. Um, you know, I, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I know it's valuable and, and we really appreciate you, uh, you listening to this. Uh, please uh, hop on our Slack community. And, uh, you know, if you're interested, learn more about Nats. Always happy to talk.